I would like to um, welcome you to the second panel of the International Biennial Verilis Enterprise for Art and Politics Conference, which, um, like this morning, so the earlier pa panel discussion, is informed and inspired by the many themes and issues in the complex work called Seeds of Change by Maria Theresa Alves that uh, uh, won the Verilis Enterprise. Um, I mentioned in the morning, I just want to repeat it again um, at the risk of um, uh, saying it twice, what you've already heard. The schedule for this afternoon is that we now have another uh, panel discussion focusing on seeds as storytellers, but also seeds, seeds as witnesses from 2.30 to 4.30. Then we invite you to join us for a um, greet and meet session at the Verilist Atrium, which is at 66 West 12th Street. So it's one block south of here on the ground floor. Um, it's a gathering for you know, all of us uh, participants in the conference and presenters. At six o'clock, right next door to the atrium is the keynote presentation or conversation, I should say, between Maria Teresa Alves and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, which is preceded um, by what is grandly called the prize ceremony. It's the moment when uh, we have the opportunity to actually uh, present the prize to Maria Teresa Alves, which today will be done by Sharif Kiwan, who is a member of Abunadara, the previous prize recipient, and um, the group's uh, spokesperson. So that's at six to seven o'clock. Then we invite you to join us at the opening for the exhibition, which is at Parsons on Fifth Avenue between uh, 12th and 13th Street, um, seven o'clock to eight or 8.30. I also quickly want to remind you that tomorrow we continue with two more panels. Tomorrow the panel's focus is on the prize finalists, five groups that were nominated by um, our Nominators Council. They are Forensic Architecture, Gulf Labor, the House of Natural Fiber, Izuma TV, and Made You Look. And I failed to point out that on Sunday, we're actually continuing with a um, weed walk. From 12 to 2 o'clock, we're gathering on the High Line in the northern part of it under the guidance of Marissa Preffer, who will take us around and open our eyes to ballast flora on the High Line. Next week, the um, exhibition is, of course, open all the time, almost all the time. <laughs> but we have two lunchtime readings. Um, on Tuesday, we're really thrilled that Wendy Walters, who is a member of the faculty here at the New School, will read from a recent publication of hers in the gallery. That's from 12.30 to 2 o'clock. And we, um, uh, it's an informal um, gathering inspired, again, by Marie Theresa's work. So with that, my deep thanks, of course, to all of you. And I also want to express my particular appreciation to Lara Kaldi, curator from Palestine, who is um, a member of the Verilis Center's Nominators Council and the person who nominated Maria Theresa Alves for the prize. So we owe it all to you, <laughs> Lara. <laughs> so thank you very much. And um, the panelists on your right are Jane Bennett, Marisa Prefer, and Radhika Subramaniam. And then in the audience is uh, Katayun Chamani, who is a member of the New School faculty and will act as a respondent. And um, with that, another greeting to Maria Theresa, who just arrived. <laughs> nice to see you again. And um, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you for, for the introduction, uh, Karen. <laughs> Um, I'm really, really happy to be here um, among friends, new friends, uh, colleagues, um, with Maria Teresa Alves, whom I've had the honor to work with on several occasions and have learned a lot from. Um, I also thank um, uh, Amanda, Palmer, and Emily, and Jennifer, and Michelle for supporting and helping in all of this. Um, I must do my disclaimer. Uh, I'm jet lagged and so sometimes I will not be making any sense. I feel a bit like a phone without a signal. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you... So, uh, yeah. Excuse me if I don't do justice to, to your um, papers. Um, if, as Jane Bennett actually suggests, um, ecology is the story, uh, of the place where we live, uh, or better, the place that we live, then Maria Teresa Alves forges a solidarity with seeds and plants in order to produce, to produce new ecologies, new stories, 
during the last panel, we see how land or you know, landscape and territories are a construction of colonial policies, even more so. As um, uh, Tomas said, monuments of genocide, right? I, I live in a landscape which is a monument of genocide. Um, uh, forging these landscapes, forge and produce identities, um, ecologizing territories uh, rather than contributing to, this, to their ecology. Uh, landscapes could also be byproducts of a free market or a history of slave trade, as again Maria Teresa Alves shows us. After all, the paradigm of the Anthropocene has its roots in the history of colonialism, as also mentioned in the first panel. However, the ecologizing and making of these landscapes can also produce an ecology of descent. Um, descent in vegetables and things, as well as humans. Or maybe one and the same produces descent in all of us together. Seeds decide to wake from their dormancy and break concrete in Liverpool, for example, um, telling us um, stories of slave trade, as Maria Teresa Alves uncovers in her work, uh, Seeds of Change. Olive trees grow in the dead trunks of European pine trees brought by the European settlers in Palestine as Ilan Pape tells us. Hmm. Um, cactus trees, cactus growing um, uh, on the uh, landscape of genocide as Israelis, Israeli settlers uh, try to um, hide uh, the ruins um, of Palestinian homes destroyed during the Nakba, cactus grows because the Palestinians used to grow cactus as borders of their uh, homes, right? Cactus grows back. Um, we see these changes because we might have similar inclinations, right? Similar wills and desires as those plants, or perhaps even not on the level of metaphor and similarity. This is very, very important for our speakers today. It's not at the level of metaphor or similarity with plants and seeds. We share those sentiments. My colleagues on this panel will be addressing the very difficult questions and tasks of how to speak to, or rather with, the non-human, without the human taking center stage, which is always a, seems to be a problem and thus producing different ecologies. Again, stories of the place that we live. I must add that this is a very difficult task because everything around us nowadays is subjected to a logic of competition and hierarchies between one product and another, between ethnic groups, between human and non-human, between subject and object, between invasive and local species, and the list continues. And I mean, those are binaries, but I must uh, um, emphasize that they are governed by a logic of competition. Um, and so I think it's difficult to, um, to speak from the point of view of plants, vegetables, and seeds in this kind of aggressive environment. Mm -hmm. My colleagues rather try to find affinities uh, like in Maria Teresa Alves' work, where everyone and everything which has struggled to survive assembles together to speak and to resist. Okay. Let me introduce the speakers. Um, but I've kind of lost my... Um, sorry. Second. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had yes. 
I now introduce you to my colleagues, <laughs> who will each present for um, 10 to 15 minutes with a response at the end from Katayun, uh, which will continue into a conversation, uh, hopefully with your participation as well. Um, so we will begin with Jane Bennett, uh, who will be speaking about <coughs> what are some best practices for the task of writing up the experience of vegetal encounter, and what kind of writing has the best chance of keeping faith with vegetation, with the veg vegetal life that is both inside and outside of us. Jane Bennett is professor of political science at John Hopkins University. Um, she specializes in ecological philosophy, American political thought, political rhetoric and persuasion, and contemporary social theory. She has been developing a new political ecology and redefining materialism, um, uh, beginning with her book Thoreau's Nature, Ethics, Politics and the Wild, Modernity and Political Thought. Um, and more recently, in Vibrant Matter, a, a political ecology of, of things. Um, uh, currently, Bennett is working on a study of influence as a natural force, a study which the poetry of Walt Whitman plays an important role. Jane. Okay, <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here as part of the celebration of the work of Maria Teresa Alves and also the celebration of the Vera List Center. Um, Alves, by doting on seeds and plants, reveals to us the ongoing presence of flows of communication between plants and between them and us. And I want to say, her work also disturbs the them-us mode of experience, in that it also points to a vegetality within the human. In so doing, we are called to rethink just what the human is. In what follows then, I'm going to try to highlight the inner plant and also offer a few words about what practices of language use might be more faithful to the vegetal life that's around us and within us. I begin with how Alves draws attention to the morphogenetic and epigenetic communications by which seeds become plants, so sort of intra-plant communications. Very old seeds deposited in ballast from faraway places transmute themselves through intracellular signals and also through, through real-time responses to environmental impacts into the mature plants that are arranged into the seeds of change. These plants, as etymologists and botanists tell us, continue to communicate amongst themselves. We know, for example, that plants speak to each other through root systems, systems that themselves incorporate networks of tiny tubular fungi, fungi that offer their bandwidth to the trees in exchange for sugar molecules. We know that plants engage in alleopathy, whereby they exude biochemicals to influence the germination, growth, or survival of other plants in the vicinity. And we know that plants emit plumes of volatile organic compounds to signal the presence of insect herbivores. Alvis's inspiring work also highlights plant-to-people or cross-species communications. We here tell from ballast plants of encounters with sailors, colonizers, enslaved peoples, and former homelands, and of still ongoing transmissions between things, places, and people. Alves makes more apparent, for example, the durability of slavery, uh, uh, whose duration, to paraphrase Henri Bergson in Creative Evolution, gnaws into the future, into our present, and leaves the mark of its tooth." End quote. I have so far noted only a few of the ways that Seeds of Change exposes the force of vegetal life around us. As I mentioned, her work also intensifies a more uncanny experience, the experience of the vegetal within, of the ways in which the human is itself also vegetal. So I'm going to try to talk about the vegetal self now. How are selves vegetal? Well, we too receive and respond to those volatile organic compounds exuded by plants. Human flesh, it turns out, continually takes in and replies to for floral and other scents, both those we can smell and those that operate below the radar of sensuous detection. Human bodies have thousands of olfactory chemoreceptors sprinkled across its surface and in our internal organs. And these receive and respond to odor molecules 
such that one study shows that exposing olfactory receptors to a, quote, sandalwood odor sets off a cascade of molecular signals that appears to induce healing in, healing in injured tissue. Another study says that, quote, a primary odor compound in violets and roses appeared to inhibit the spread of prostate cancer cells by switching off errant genes. And a third that, quote, a fragrance re redolent of lily of the valley promoted the regeneration of muscle tissue. Now, to cite a more obvious example of inner vegetality, we can just talk about eating. Human flesh is partly composed itself of the seeds, leaves, and roots that we eat. Um, and these nourish, sicken, or intoxicate us, or otherwise alter us. Take, for example, one of the plants grown in the ballast seed garden in 2012 in Bristol as part of Alvis's exhibit there. It's called Datura stramonium, or the thorn apple, also known as the Jamestown weed, um, named for the town, the early settler town in, in Virginia where, where they, it appeared. Uh, and then that's been shortened to the Jimson weed sometimes. Um, the nativity of the Jimson weed, or the Jamestown weed, is still contested even today. Um, some people refer back to a medieval account that claims it was brought to England from Constantinople. Um, others say India was its original home, and others say it's native to North America. And as we've heard and started to think about from the last panel, the question of plant nativity is all tangled up with a more anthropocentric kind of politics. Um, this plant, the James, Jamestown weed, is a hallucinogen. As I first learned while reading Henry Thoreau's 1865 account of his trip to Cape Cod. So all things were centering for me as I prepared to come here around the Jamestown weed. I'm reading Thoreau and he's citing the Jamestown weed and then I see it's on the list of the ballast plants and so I took that as a sign. Um, Okay, so he's writing in 1865 Henry Thoreau about his trip to Cape Cod, and this is what he says about it. Um, he's referring to the thorn apple or the Jamestown weed. The thorn apple was in full bloom along the beach. This cosmopolite, the captain cook among plants, was carried in ballast all over the world, but it's not an innocent plant. It suggests not merely commerce, but its attendant vices, end quote. So the thorn apple, says Thoreau, having itself been infused with the influences of human traders and slavers, repeats and transmits those not innocent tendencies back to him many years later. Now Thoreau doesn't eat the plant, but he makes, but the plant nonetheless uh, makes a visual impression on him, and that infects him with a sense of the past that it lived through and which continues to endure. The weed recalls the vices of the slave trade, and in response to that, Thoreau has an auditory hallucination, which he records. He says he hears voices of men shouting aboard a vessel. Okay. Now, Thoreau provides further evidence of the psychotropic duration of the thorn apple by citing a 1722 account of Virginia settlers, ostensibly in Jamestown, who ate a salad of its leaves to these effects. And now I'm quoting from that earlier uh, 1722 account. Here's what happens if you eat those leaves. One sailor would blow up a feather in the air. Another would dart straws at it. Another, stark naked, was sitting up in a corner like a monkey, grinning, making mouths at them. A fourth would fondly kiss and paw his companions. A thousand simple tri tricks they played. After 11 days, they returned to themselves again, not remembering anything that had passed. Now, under the influence of the Jamestown weed, a person is, again to quote Thoreau, a body groping for organs. You expand like a seed in the ground. You exist in your roots like a tree in winter. Now, the Jamestown weed continues to tell stories, most recently in Monmouth County, New Jersey, where high school students are getting high on the seeds. Um, and the seeds, which, judging from the serious hospitalizations that have resulted, are more toxic than the leaves. And here's a quote from the, one of the newspaper reports about this. The 16-year-old's heart, after ingesting the seeds of the Jamestown weed, was pounding hard at 190 beats per minute. Eight or nine men had to hold him down so he could be sedated." End quote. Now, the vegetal self expressed in Monmouth as a, in a very dramatic way, in this very dramatic uh, physiological posture, um, but it can also manifest as a more benign bodily comportment, set of uh, comportment or comportments. Thoreau again provides one example of, of those. Um, he writes in his uh, 
journal on July 23rd, 1851, which must have been a really hot and sticky Massachusetts day, um, he notes that when he's, quote, out of doors, his power of thinking is drowned and shrunken, pressed down by the pressure of the atmosphere, which is, eight, which is 15 pounds per square inch. So he feels the pressure of the atmosphere. Now, on that day, it's too hot to think. But what happens is another of his faculties, a vegetal power that can receive without thinking, can receive without judging, um, is able to come to the fore. Thoreau um, res, uh, reports that as his power to think is shrunk and drowned, what happens is this other thing happens, is um, he nods like the rye heads in the breeze. Right? So this nodding, this bobbing of the head, is a vegetal posture that repeats the rhythms of waves of grain over in the field there. He nods like the rye heads in the breeze. OK, so this just to sort of suggest that there's a lively vegetal world around us, and there's a lively vegetal world at work within us. Now, if plants infect and inflect the vectors and rhythms of human metabolism, moods, thinking styles, body postures, if they are so profoundly entangled with the flesh, then it makes sense maybe to try to flesh out, or cellulose out, the figure of a vegetal subjectivity, to try to think a vegetal subjectivity that subsists alongside cognitive, affective, gendered, racialized subjectivities. For my last few minutes, um, I want to raise the question of how to think the vital force of the inner plant. What kind of language, what grammar, what poetics could be most faithful to a vegetality whose native expression is not, of course, word-like or wordy? Um, within the default grammar of English, which tends to divide experience into active subjects and passive objects, the vegetal tends to be figured as passive, as that which is acted upon or receptive, or only receptive. Um, but plants are, of course, very active, both when they live outside us and when they live in us. And so I think the articulation and exploration of vegetal subjectivity needs to find a verbal form that is a workaround the grammar of subject-object Active passive, you need a workaround. And I've been thinking about this. It's it's not easy to it's not easy task. Um, but one one thing I stumbled upon is you you might favor the use of verbs that approximate what linguists call the middle voice. Now, middle voiced verbs, in contrast to verbs in either the active or the passive voice, are they're marked formally in classical Greek and in Sanskrit, but they're not marked formally in English and many uh, modern European languages, maybe a little bit more in German. Um, they name the kind of activity that emerge from a process. Um, and they name the kind of activity that has an efficacy whose impetus comes from multiple and entangled sources, um, rather than from singular entities or individuals. So take, for example, Walt Whitman's phrase, I sing the body electric. And I'm, I'm, it's not technically in the middle voice, but it's sort of approximation of the middle voice there, that idea of to sing. Um, the I that I sing the body electric, the I that sings is active, but only insofar as it is entangled in a creative sound process that involves ears, um, poetic words spoken aloud, beating hearts, electric charges. Now, if there is any choosing to sing on the part of the poet, it's best understood as a passage through an intermediate state of cohesion, a sense of apprehending a variety of presences amidst and within. So middle-voiced verbs tend to be process-oriented rather than those that position an actor um, and his acts in an inert field or a you know, kind of void. Examples here might also include the verb, to, like you play with it, I play, or um, to inaugurate. Because if you inaugurate, something's already happening and you're just sort of an adding in. Um, to inflect, to induce, to attest, to partake of, to sing maybe also to germinate. Um, such verbs mark activities with multiple loci of impetus, and they position an I, any I, as already caught up in an ongoing, ongoing flow that precedes it and to which it may add impetus or drag. Such verbs position the human participant as always already involved in a creative flow before it is even possible to explicitly feel that one has acted. And because they suggest that agency is distributive, 
they begin to give voice to a subjectivity that is at once animal, mineral, human, and vegetal. Okay, just by way of conclusion, um, I don't know if it's, well, it's hit Baltimore, so maybe it has, maybe that's the cool spot that hasn't hit New York yet, but there's these t-shirts that say 100% human is, yeah, okay. Um, um, yeah, I knew it. Um, so these 100% these human t-shirts are part of a socially conscious fashion collection whose mission statement is this, and I quote from the website. The 100% human collection arrives after a season of social unrest, political tensions, and one controversial election that brought to light just how divided the nation really is. It's true, we don't always agree, but it doesn't mean we have to be divided. This year, let's celebrate being 100% human. Two things matter most now, protecting rights and remembering that we are more the same than we are different, end quote. And to that end, if you buy the, the, the clothes, money is given to the human rights campaign or ACLU. Um, now, I'm a member of the ACLU and the Human Rights Campaign, and I definitely affirm the politics of invoking the value and dignity of every single human being. But to be 100% human is not, I would say, to be pure human. For nobody is pure, and that is mostly a good thing. Um, humans are multi-species variegations, or at least that's the thought I'm playing with here, and even may also be some, there may also be some political value in affirming that self-definition. 100% variegated, that's a t-shirt, marked by irregular patches or streaks, speckles, flecks, dappled. The human being is composed of human, animal, vegetable, and mineral splotches that bleed into each other, and that we live only as participants in com complex assemblages of human and non-human elements. The vegetal is one register of self-experience. So I'll stop with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, um, I'd like to now introduce Marissa. Um, Marissa uh, Preffer uh, will be proposing um, to use an expansive lens of queer ecology in order to subvert rigid cultural boundaries between living beings. Marissa is a transdisciplinary educator, urban ecologist, and amateur herbalist. Uh, Prefer works to translate knowledge within plant communities to human terms. I think we really need a translator. <laughs> um, through experiential pedagogies and cultivating ecosystems for urban resilience. Part of their work involves bringing to light the marginalized interstitial space between human and plant binaries while building energy around healing bodies. Prefer serves as the programs manager for floating food forest. Swale, as well as the landscape curator at Pioneer Works in Red Hook, Brooklyn, and um, is the horticultural advisor for Maria Teresa uh, Alves on, uh, on this project uh, that you will see this evening, Seeds of Change, New York, A Botany of Colonization. Um, she's also, she also is a practitioner. She makes uh, work with a collective called Non-Studio. So please go ahead, Marissa, thank you. First, I just want to say thank you to Karen and Amanda and everyone here at the Verla Center in the New School, um, including Maria Teresa Alves for uh, providing this incredible gathering of, of people and place um, and also plants. So I speak for the plants. Um, I speak in poetics largely. Uh, and here I go. As a gardener and herbalist, when I walk the streets, I see co-conspirators in sidewalk cracks. Maria Teresa Alves's Seeds of Change opens doors to a continuum of human-plant relationships, setting intentions beyond colonial extractionism and towards the seeds themselves. What powers do they hold? As humans, we are accustomed to ask, what is that plant good for? But not, how can we live together? Listen to each other. Dormant seeds hold the potential to say something else. They act as a latent memory in the soil seed bank, a potential cultural currency harboring stories from the past and holding on for future livelihoods. In the quest to unpack origins and encircling the idea that everything must come from somewhere, how do species that once shared space, having journeyed beyond those places, 
experience new grounds, and build symbiotic community with new others. On this big rock we call Earth, we battle with neoliberal infrastructure, political upheaval, social inequity, and continue to build systems for and about ourselves. The demarcation of this period as the Anthropocene also signifies the possibility of a juncture. Whether it's the best terminology or logic to describe the current ecological state of the planet we inhabit, the Anthropocene can serve as a moment to begin a deep dive into theories that blend intrinsically human behavior with that of concurrently evolving species. I believe this work of tapping into interspecies magic is more impeccably necessary than ever before. In particular, how can we illuminate some of the most prolific oxygen-bearing species, plants which some, some call weeds, as embodied outliers? Can we welcome them as entities that help to lubricate the fold between sentient beings and other eukaryotes, living, living things? I turn here to Donna Haraway's instance of nature culture, one word, in which the two words cannot be separated from and are, in fact, tied by the forces of each other. If we use this as a lens to consider plants that exist in mass, largely as a result of human interference, perhaps we may begin to uncover their power. Do exclusionary identities help to separate nature from culture, therefore severing a holistic view of humans as part of nature? Weeds are actants upon humans as much, if not more, as we shape the urban landscapes trying to eradicate them. Everyone holds the power to observe their tendencies. They gather at the edges of emptiness alongside highways, in vacant lots, blending, buffering, and blurring spaces between rigid and soft human places. What if conservationists stopped polluting lands by spraying invasive plants, and this is in quotes, invasive, in favor of restoring natives? Mm. Sitting with those that are thriving on the conditions presented by this nature culture, to use Donna Haraway's word, how might we look at ecological resilience as a tool not for claiming species totality, but rather inhabiting a conscious praxis of decentralization regarding dominant cultural forces, a push to unpack and dismantle environmental binaries? What if these species could encourage each other to thrive, to feed each other amidst their storied pasts? What does it look like to sit in this transitory space to observe and listen, letting the desire of what's next fade away? What do the plants want, or should we ask this of them? What do their forms of communication look, sound, or feel like? And can we deem them mutually beneficial without assigning human qualities to them? Can we work towards noticing these forms of communication, welcoming a form of interspecies solidarity. Um, and just playing up here are some, some instances of, of these plants that are both in the exhibition that you'll see tonight um, and growing wild around mostly Red Hook, Brooklyn is where you're seeing them now. So noticing weeds is somewhat akin to understanding the desires of vegetal others. In reaching out towards something considered unwanted, we can begin to build a set of inclusive methodologies that speak across disciplines and beyond known categories. Observation based on sublime reality can be an organizational method for understanding species, here or there, present or absent, instead of meticulously assigning identities to them. And again, Donna Haraway unpacks these relationships in her Companion Species Manifesto. She says, I believe that all ethical relation within or between species is knit from the silk strong thread of ongoing alertness to otherness in relation. We are not one, and being depends on getting on together. The obligation is to ask who are present and who are emergent. If symbiosis were a liquid, enveloping all of its inhabitants, volunteer plants are part of the continuum of life, just as much as the mums planted in pots alongside suburban driveways. Similarly, the act of citing any life form as an immigrant merely marks a moment in time. Mm -hmm. Who, when, and what exactly constitutes something or someone as native or as immigrant? These terms are signified based on any number of markers and appropriate acknowledgement of time, place, context, identity, and social conditions. The upholding of nati nativity as a static identity 
reinforces the binaries between place and time. You are either native or you are not. This in turn also strengthens the social constructs of culture as pitted against nature in opposition to the idea that they cannot be separated as we all are and we all live in the same wild. Permaculturalist and former conservationist Tao Orion holds space for the blending of terminologies when she says, modern research increasingly shows that all native plant communities are, to some extent, the products of human intervention. I recognize these spontaneous plants as doing the work of imbuing our landscapes with the cultural memories of colonial movements, and at the same time, blending boundaries between waste and notions of the other. I have, I have this plant here with me that I'm gonna talk about now for a minute. Uh, it's called mugwort. In Eastern North America, when late summer heat sets in, tiny inconspicuous mug, mugwort, or Artemisia vulgaris, seeds develop, ripening while bitter compounds complexify within its leaves. Autumn winds sweep through the alleyways and empty lots, and seeds of mugwort are released from their pasts, projected by wind into their potential futures. It is fairly easy for these seeds to find a new home. They carry only the weight of themselves, are pollinated by wind, and need little to thrive, doing so in most soils and light conditions. In some ways, mugwort seems to even be drawn to the inter interstitial spaces between here and there. Sorry, I lost my spot. As a perennial herb, it comes back stronger every year. It is always impossible or almost impossible to eradicate and often finds ground that is not already occupied by any other of its kind. What does it mean that these plants follow us? Perhaps migration is a language of plant communication. The exact origins of a plant can be somewhat difficult to decipher. Some plants have been deemed to be from many places. Mm. Mugwort is believed to have been found earliest in Asia and Eastern Europe, and, and some say it's even native to North America. It carries a habit for vigorous reproduction via rhizomatous rootstock beneath the ground, using lateral methods to inhabit sandy roadsides and contaminated soil. It is a known phytoaccumulator, performing well when employed to remove cadmium from soil compounds, and having migrated to the Americas, by many means, mugwort has been, this is a quote, introduced to at least six separate locations in North America via ship ballast, ranging from the Arctic to both oceanic shorelines and on multiple occasions in several of these locations. Mugwort also has a long-standing history of widespread usage in relation to the human body, externally for rashes, internally as a bitter stimulant for the circulatory and nervous systems, and for the relief of abdominal cramping. But it is also a powerful spiritual and energetic healer for humans in the many places where the plant grows. In Chinese medicine, healers use mugwort in a practice called moxibustion to stimulate qi. And for the Chumash people of Southern California, it is traditionally dried and burned in an act of enhancing lucid dreams, cleansing, and for calling upon ancestors. Plants can reach or encourage transcendental space, moving beyond the assessment of phytochemicals, beyond facts, and towards experiential, intergenerational, interspecies storytelling. Timothy Morton calls upon this species blending transcendence in his newest book, Humankind, which I highly recommend. Arguing between disciplines and states of thought, he says, worlds are perforated and permeable which is why we can share them. Cellular walls separate plants from animals. These walls help to bind, nourish, and regulate growth, providing strength and protection. What can humans learn from these permeable walls between worlds, between species? Thank you. Yeah, no signal. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Um, uh, we move now to uh, Radhika Subramaniam. 
Uh, Radhika will be attempting to think from the seat's point of view um, and will be addressing dormancy um, and the political uh, implications of waiting, I, I believe. Uh, Radhika is a curator, editor, and writer with an interdisciplinary practice that deploys such platforms as exhibitions, texts, and public interventions as conscious forms of knowledge making. Uh, she's interested in the poetics and politics of crisis and surprises, particularly urban crowds, cultures of catastrophe, and human animal relationships. She's the director and chief curator of the Sheila uh, Johnson Design Center at the New School here. Uh, and she teaches um, in the School of Art and, and Design History and Theory at Parsons School of Design. She's presently working on an experimental narrative nonfiction titled The Elephant's Eye. To you, Radhika. Where's she going to stand? I'm, a, I'm better at the point. <laughs> So I, I, I want to thank Karen, of course, for this wonderful invitation and everyone at ViraList, and to Maria Teresa for the, for the inspiration to think about what seeds might mean for change. And so um, this sort of provocation or proposition is trying to take seriously what we might learn from seeds and is called Eight Notes for a Seedy Politics. One. Hold your breath. In souvenir stalls in India, artists accost you, offering to write your name on a grain of rice. As a child, I was intrigued by the claim that entire scriptural texts might be written on these grains until a smug adolescent skepticism overturned the magic. After all, I thought, who could really check if this was true? <laughs> Years later, at an exhibition of Mughal miniature paintings at the Met, well equipped with a magnifying glass, I was arrested by the folds of the churidar pants worn by a minor courtier in the corner of the frame, each fold drawn by the artist as if just for this moment of illumination. The man who got into the Guinness Book of World Records for writing the maximum number of characters on a grain of rice says he couldn't do it without a daily practice of yoga. He has taught himself to hold his breath for up to two minutes so that he can bring his ultimate focus to the task. The seed teaches the artist that time can stand still. Two, bide your time. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault, whose ambition is to safeguard the world's agricultural biodiversity, houses seeds from around the world. The location is high in the Arctic permafrost deep in a sandstone mountain on an island well removed from tectonic activity. Here the seeds lie, like the princess in the fairy tale, packed in foil packages and stored on shelves in conditions expected to slow metabolic activity and induce a sort of deep sleep. This isn't new to seeds, of course, who are well known for staying dormant. But dormancy isn't a cryogenic stupor awaiting the passing prince of good conditions to kiss it awake. Each seed that actually falls to the ground feels no need to sprout. Seeds can stay dormant despite favorable conditions, waiting for necessity to come to meet them rather than manufacturing their own necessities. They remind us that in our eagerness to give voice or indeed to find our own voices, we might forget that silence is a part of speech. Mm. Three, make time. Between the experiences of a doctor's waiting room and the airport lounge, we have come to understand waiting as a mixture of anxiety, frustration, and boredom. To this, add the tension of idling in traffic or the irateness of hearing the MTA announce yet another subway incident guaranteed to make you late. Such waiting is empty time from which we restlessly escape, if we can, into phones and books. Then there is the fortitude and patience of waiting for recognition waiting to make it big. Although some, they say, remain in the waiting room of history destined never to get on stage. The job of the seed is endurance. It's skill, the ability to wait it out, nurturing, nourishing, biding its time quietly to give forms to things as yet inchoate. This waiting is not a dumb, inaudible languishing in the sidelines, but rather a time of making, a poetic time of blind insight, giving shape to what's ahead imagining what else could be. Four, 
lion weight. If there is anything my backyard in Brooklyn has taught me, it's to be open to surprises. You may say it's because I'm an erratic gardener, once misguided enough to actively cultivate a weed garden, transplanting every bold interloper sternly pointed out to me into a riotous patch of their own together. But the fact is, any gardener willing to admit it knows there's always the danger of an ambush. And really, what would gardening be if you didn't have to putter around watchfully every day? For many, part of the daily surveillance is keeping an eagle eye out for the sly sprout putting its head above ground where it isn't wanted. Sometimes I think there must be a sort of seed theater in which we are the clowns on stage performing in a puppet entertainment. We lop a vine and another tendril pops up, pull the stalk up only to make room for another, mow the lawn and the dandelions return anyway. When there is a lot of sound and fury on stage, perhaps it's more fun to startle the so-called stars as they come off and revel in the effectiveness of that pratfall. Five, pack light. Imagine the sea dark in the hold of the ship, tossed willy-nilly amid the gravel, sand, earth, and metal. The seed is nimble, open to the snags and accidents of travel. The mighty oaken timbers of the ship creak and call. For all its freedom of movement, the seed is a landlubber. It waits for wind, water, animal, and human to lead it back to the soil or to the crevice of a building. In the vortex of the transatlantic triangular trade, the gravel and sand of ballast hefted a, gl a global movement of commodities and cash crops, weighted against enslaved Africans, they kept the ships swift and on keel. Weighed in this balance, the humble seeds must bear the historical weight of their violent dispersal, just as the discarded ballast ba bears the weight of the enslaved men and women, just as in that little acorn you may feel the weight of the mighty oak to come. Six, unsettle. These days, the US Customs is vigilant about what it will allow in. The woman in front of me at JFK has her apple confiscated. Clearly, there are to be no more Johnny or Janie apple seeds. All plant material requires something called a phytosanitary certificate, assuring us of their rightful future intentions. CBP is particularly suspicious about soil and earth which could carry possible pathogens, although concession is made for any recklessly joyous returning American tourist who might bring home a small container of decorative beach sand. <laughs> In general, migration is an iffy business and you never know where you may land. The seas that once traveled the slave routes found themselves tossed ashore across the coastlines of the world together with the rest of the discarded debris, removed, displaced, dispersed, discarded. As cities like New York grew corpulent with the fruits of such landfill, some seeds within have disturbed this incessant growth enough to sprout. Rest uneasy and look around you. You'd be hard put to know who isn't a New Yorker. <laughs> Seven, tell tales. If you see something, say something, is Homeland Security's strangely opaque anti-terrorism national campaign. Without any clear indicators of what someone might mean, it has probably done a better job of sowing suspicion and fear than anything else. Surely knowing what to notice and how to see would have been a key step in this training. <laughs> this week in particular in New York, we wish someone had said something. These incidents have acquired their own routines, attacks, injury, death, the killing of a perpetrator, and subsequent daily reports based on forensics. It might be small consolation this time that the attacker was apprehended alive to say something, just to tell us why. There is a type of biotechnology called genetic use restriction technology, G-U-R-T, used to create terminator genes that result in sterile seeds. Strongly opposed by many indigenous peoples, NGOs, and some governments, this technology isn't in widespread use yet. Speak up because the suicide seeds, as they're called, that GURT will produce, will not live to tell tales. They bear the weight of history with no possibility of germinating a future. Eight, seediness. This is certainly a seedy story of seeds that tell a seamy side of history. My dictionary tells me that seediness is being shabby, run down, inferior, and a bit disreputable. The earliest usage is over 400 years ago, and the etymology is likely related to plants and flowers going to seed. 
Seeing such plants as having an untidy appearance has migrated the meaning of seediness to mean things more generally unseemly. If a tousled plant is a sign of disrepute, unseemliness has simply become a matter of propriety and indelicacy. Yet it seems to me that so many things are indeed unseemly. So much is not what it seems. The, story, the stories in Maria Teresa Alves's seeds are unseemly stories, stories that rend open the well-sown seams of historical narratives. And these are surely unseemly times. So what might happen if the ground of meaning and utterance was not relinquished, seeded, C-E-D-E-D, -E -E that is, by the seed? And what sort of a future might be seeded by a seedy politics born of a seedier poetics? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Um, we uh, will now uh, have Katayun will uh, respond to uh, to our panelists. Um, Katayun Tremani is the Mon Family Professor and Chair of the Department of Natural Sciences and Math at Eugene Lang College. She is the principal investigator of a collaborative project titled Stem Cells Across the Curriculum, an open access modular curriculum that incorporates uh, infographic thinking, narrative cases, art, and biology. She's the recipient of the New School University Distinguished Teaching Award and the Williams E. Bennett Award for Extraordinary Contribution to Citizen Science. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Karen, for inviting me. And I must say, after that set of comments, I feel quite humbled um, and a little bit nervous to be able to try to thread a coherent response to all of that. So. I may jump around a bit, um, but I'm also going to be sort of trying to overlay a biological perspective. And I think I'll pick up where Radhika left off with your lesson number eight, I believe, of seediness. Um, this notion of how can we maybe make visible what is un invisible. And so what I thought was interesting about all of the comments um, was you all spoke about time and space, but in very different ways, and positionality. So whether that positionality was about power or privilege and agency, or whether it was about geography, environment, juxtapositions, the places where we intersect or our contact zones, or whether it was about time allowing for ambush, marination, um, potentiality. So I thought that was a really interesting commonality among all of your um, comments. And I guess I'll pick up with that by sort of overlaying position or space in transposition, in biology, time in terms of epigenetics, which um, Jane mentioned, but I will try to dig a little deeper into, and talk about how these things together are really about how, um, I believe as Marissa said, um, Donna Haraway saying, we are not trying to be one, but a mix with each other. How do we live together um, in an intersectional way? And to me, that's about dynamic responses, being able to respond to one another in appropriate and meaningful ways. And so I will try to walk us through some of this. And I wrote pink. I do color coding to try to do my respondent. So I tried to pick up on particular terms and comments that um, each of you said. So I'll try to interweave that as well. So one of the things that I thought was interestingly brought up was uh, what is native? or what is the original, or what is the pure. Um, and so I pull this up, and this is from recently, from 2015, in Nature, uh, which is a journal that many scientists read. And it says the sweet potato is already a GM crop. And so this also picks up on Radhika's last theme about the terminator seeds. So what does it mean uh, to have a sweet potato be a GM crop? Well, it basically means that the sweet potato, as a plant, has thousands of bacterial genes in it. Um, and many, many other plants' genes in it as well. And so it is, by nature, uh, a hybrid. And so we might think, okay, well, that's maybe an unusual situation. But it turns out the flip is also true. So just a couple years ago, the Loki bacteria, which many of my students know from anime and comic strips, um, was found in a cold vent in, a, in the oceans, and it was found to have thousands of plant genes and human genes <laughs> and other animal genes. And so the journalist here describes this as a genomic starter kit. 
I would prefer to call it a grab bag of biodiversity. Um, so it, to me, means more to say that you have sort of potentiality in your toolkit or your grab bag, and you use it as needed in appropriate responses to the other organisms that you are interacting and coming into contact with all the time. And so if we take this further um, and look at other plants, so this work has actually been going on for quite some time. This is the resurrection mutant. It's my favorite genetic mutant because <laughs> it says something very interesting about reproduction in seeds. And it speaks to this notion of um, the cryogenic uh, seed bank that Radhika mentioned, that the seeds, in a sense, can choose whether they're going to germinate or not. And it's not always about the kinds of human qualities we would say are good for an environment, that perhaps the seeds have their own criteria. And so this is about a plant that will literally take its lipids, its fatty materials, and distribute them differently among seeds. So some are quote unquote aborted seeds, and 70% of those will not germinate. But then another 30% will, but only in certain conditions, conditions that we don't entirely understand. And so if you look at this quote, it says here, it appeared to have died, and I left it in a room for two or three weeks. So again, this is the human placing on the plant and seed what they think is an inhospitable environment. I was just slow in throwing it away. So this is about the weeding and the you know taking care of and the nurturing and the vigilance that Radhika mentioned. Um, but he says he's also a member of this. So it said, when I went to throw it away, I noticed that it had sh small shoots coming up as if it had returned to life. And so the name of this mutant is called Resurrection One, which I think is kind of an interesting term. So what I think is most fascinating is if we look at humans, um, humans who do this work and human genomes, we've been doing this work since the early 1900s. We've known about jumping genes, transposable elements. This was the seminal work of Barbara McClintock, who was mocked when she brought this forward into the scientific community. Um, she would have to walk the halls of Cold Spring Harbor alone uh, with laughter. Ended up getting a Nobel Prize, but took some time. And what her work was looking at was the variegation. And so I think this business of the 100% human, and we are 100% variegated, is a commonality among all organisms. So on the right-hand side, what I'm showing you is that the human genome, once published the rough draft in 2000, shows you that almost 50% of the human genome is from other organisms. These are called transposable or um, viral vestigial elements in our genome. This is our grab bag. So the fact that we carry around 50% of our genome as a grab bag of potential biodiversity so that we can maybe speak to our vegetal selves, really responding to different environments, to me is fascinating. Um, but we are very, very highly regulated, just like the seeds who choose when they will germinate. We also are very careful about this almost 45% of our genome. So what we do with this part of the genome is we regulate it chemically. We can fold it um, like an origami pattern and we can decide which genes are going to be activated in which environments. That environment, I speak of very loosely here, the built environment, the social environment, the natural environment. And so if you look here, this is a fascinating way of thinking about it. Here you are, a human, with microbes and viruses as part of your genome. We've known about this now. We're not just all human cells. But now we have to think about even our own genome as being part plant, part bacteria, part virus. And that when we go out into different places, either by force or by choice, whether we are migrated, trafficked, whether we are sold or moved or we move consciously, we are exposed to all kinds of things in our environment. And those things in the environment are actually going to reprogram chemically that 45% of the genome. So that 45% of the genome will then change how our organs and our physiology work. So Jane talked about the volatile compounds of the plants actually changing our emotions, our hallucinogens, our, our perception, our activities. And that can be drilled all the way down to the molecules that are making those cells change, move, react, and communicate with not only one another, and what I think is most interesting is what are we doing to the environments that they are doing to us? So to me, this is a constant dynamic ping pong effect between our 
quote unquote outside environment and our quote unquote inside environment. I think those boundaries are very fluid as all three of you have eloquently and beautifully um, illustrated today. So this is drilling down into those cells. So this is literally an, uh, an imaginary, if you will, folding, but also based on real data of a genome in one particular cell. So if this cell was in your skin, it would look like this. But if it's in your eyes or in your uh, bile and, you know, in your pancreas, it would have a completely different folding pattern. And so the way that the genome is managing that is it's actually throwing out loops, excluding parts of the genome and including parts of the genome in this really dynamic way so that each tissue can behave and respond to its environment. So no two cells are actually showing their DNA in the same way. <clears throat> so if we drill down, we can see that it's an incredibly physical property of grabbing and looping DNA around. That's the right-hand picture on the bottom as you zoom in. But what I think is really interesting is thinking about what this means when we place our human ideas of what is native or what is um, valuable, if you will, right? Who is valuable? What do we notice? What don't we notice? So I'm sure many of you know of the power that we place on um, distinguishing cheeses. How many of you are cheese lovers here? Right? OK, so where your cheese comes from kind of matters. Um, the notion of French champagne being very different from California sparkling wine. Right? These notions of geography and culture, and, and I say culture in quotes, like culture, how do you grow culture? human culture, socially constructed culture. One of the most fascinating things that came out this year was this notion that terroir, or the geography, the space in which things are grown and cultivated, um, is perhaps a, a falsehood. So I'll give you just one example with the cheese. If you look at the rind of cheese, and you start to do a genomic mapping of the things that are in that rind, you find that there's an incredible diversity of bacteria and fungi in the rinds. But that none of the cheeses are unique to any one territory. Mm -hmm. And the things that we thought were so important, whether it was you know, made with French cows or <laughs> California cows or whatever, seems to have absolutely no bearing on what the organisms have chosen as being environmentally important, which is really humidity and salinity. So when we look at all these microbes, one of the most fascinating things was we realized most of them come from the ocean. Mm -hmm. And that was at first a surprise until you think about how cheese is made, which is that it has salt. Mm -hmm. And salt comes from the ocean. <laughs> and so I started thinking about Maria Teresa's work with the salt and the oceans and the migrations and the slave rights. And I thought, well, here's an example of your potential biodiverse grab bag because you have 4,733 genes that have migrated among these bacteria and fungi back and forth over centuries of human cultivation of making these different kinds of cheeses. And so it's that, it, to me, it's that really interesting contact zone between us and the bacteria and the fungi and the space in which we cultivate. So I place the seed now in the middle <laughs> because I think the seeds are trying to tell us something, as all three of you have said, whether it's the eight lessons that Radhika so eloquently went through. Uh, to think about patience, to think about ambush, to think about the strategies that could be employed if we just actually value that time. Um, and I also thought about what Marissa said about symbiotic community and this notion of the middle voice also that Jane brought up. Where does that play a role here when we think about chemical modification that seeds are doing that then affect us, that then again affect them, so this ping pong effect. And then I thought about solidarity. And I'm bringing up this particular image. This is Frida Kahlo's, one of her self-portraits. And it's one of my favorites because she is, I think, trying to express a vegetal self. And in this, she's really looking at not just the roots, but a rhizome. And she's really thinking about distributive agency. And she's, I think, honoring also her mestiza past. So the notion that her genome is part colonized genome and part colonized people, right? She's a mix of indigenous and European genes. And one of the most interesting things about Kahlo is when she migrated to the US, she did so at the height of the eugenics movement. And I don't think you can see this image very well. 
This was one of the first portraits she ever made, and it's of Luther Burbank. Um, and Luther Burbank was heralded as an amazing horticulturist who was doing grafting and all kinds of bizarre <laughs> um, agricultural tricks. And she has decided to represent Luther Burbank with the philodendron, which is known for its medicinal and spiritual value in a Mexican and native cultures. And she shows Luther Burbank connected to his past, his lineage, his roots, his ancestry. And one of the reasons why I think she chose Luther Burbank is not because of her, simply her fascination with the vegetal self and this notion of life and agriculture, but also because Luther Burbank, as much as he felt the environment was important for plants, like if you give them good soil and good this and the other, they'll grow strong and vibrant and they will have good hybrid vigor. So he knew hybridity was important, but he was also part of the American Breeders Association. So he was grappling with this notion of purity and nativeness and invasive genes. What does it mean to have invasive genes come into your space? And so I think, Radhika, when you talk about your lesson number eight, um, or maybe it was seven, say something. What do we notice? What do we consider, as Marissa said, as other? What does it mean to be 100% variegated? I think these are really important questions of our time. And so I think I, I will end with just this other notion of the contact zone. And this is Mary Louise Pratt's theory of social spaces where cultures meet, clash, grapple with each other, so not unlike us and the plants, often in context of highly asymmetrical relations of power, such as colonialism, slavery, their aftermath. They are lived out in many, many parts of the world today. And last night when we were at dinner, I mentioned a very bizarre science fiction film. And Marissa was like, please go home and look it up. <laughs> so I did. There was a film in 2008 called The Happening. Did anybody see it? It was kind of a bad film. But it was also interesting, because the plot of the film is that the plants are now the ones with agency. The plants are speaking to us, and we were not listening. So what has happened here is that there is a mass epidemic of mass suicide. It starts in Central Park. Humans are just committing suicide all over the nation, and it's spreading. And so originally, it's thought to be a terrorist attack. And then we come to realize it's the plants. The plants are exuding a neurotoxin, which is inducing the humans to commit suicide, because the plants feel so threatened by human activity, anthropomorphic seen or not, whether we want to think of ourselves as part of the environment. Um, and so that was the film. That's called The Happening. So Marissa, now you can go out and watch this terrible film. <laughs> but, but I did think it was an interesting way to end my comments, because I think all three of you are saying, what is it that we notice? And then what do we value? And how do we automatically assume a human agency when maybe it's not human? Maybe something else is at play. And so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Katayun. And I think with this, with this uh, science fiction film that you're talking about, it's actually it's it's funny because uh, you know I mentioned this at the beginning. It's this um, this logic of competition. Right? If it's either us or the plants, right? It's like a, trying to imagine, uh, for example, the planet without humans all the time. Is is it's without or with? It's it's as if we if we don't control nature. Right, nature will exterminate us. Right, it's 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 a logic of competition. It's either us or it's either. Um, I wanted to first see if you would like to um, respond to um, Katayon's response before I ruin all of this and ask questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, if if you would like to to respond, if not, then I will go ahead and start. Um, asking um, my questions. But, uh, maybe it comes I up. I just have, yeah. I, 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 it was, thank you, it was great. Um, just could you say a word or two, um, Katayun, about biomimicry? It's the mimicry part that I, that I was yes, yes, fascinated sure. also by. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think biomimicry is, um, 
one of those ways that we place the humanness at the center, right? So the idea is, oh, we finally figured out that the nature has a way of doing things, but now we're just going to mimic it. Um, and I would argue there's a different way to come at that. And rather to say we're mimicking nature, I, I really liked what Marissa was saying was that what if we just see ourselves as part of nature and we model, um, we, we model from, from nature, but also nature is sort of modeling from us. I guess I'm trying to say that there's not really this dichotomy. And so I actually find some challenge around things like Anthropocene and biomimicry. I think it puts too much agency at the, at the human level. So I was sort of playing around with that um, by saying, like, if you actually look at the genomes that are doing sort of all of the work, they are doing it without any of our intervention. Thank you. I, you want to yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to, I mean, um, perhaps uh, I ask each of you a different question. Um, um, but of course, if, if you have, um, you know, if you'd like to say anything to that. I, I couldn't help but think, that, you know, this, um, while listening to your, to your talk, of um, this question of, you know, the political implications of thinking with plants and vegetables, but also with, with Marissa's talk. Um, I mean, again, speaking, speaking about plants or with plants and seeds, not as metaphors or, you know, representation um, in themselves, um, being affected and affecting at the same time. I mean, what what are the the political implications of this? And maybe perhaps I, you know, go back to a little bit to the session, uh, the first session this morning, and um, and this problematizing of uh, you know the indigenous, right? Um, and I think everyone has referred to this um, kind of. Um, this the question of the native in this session as well as that, in that uh, the problem with uh, with um, defining the indigenous is is that the indigenous belongs to nature, and if if we have this relationship again with nature it, to control it, then the indigenous ends up being on that side, right? It's like it's uh, different sides. So I think that's in a sense a political implication of of thinking with plants or with vegetables. But I mean, I wonder, uh, as a political scientist as well, what, what are the political implications of thinking with, not against, or thinking, um, yeah, of being not 100% human? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm just thinking this on the fly, and maybe I'll regret that I said it later, but um, maybe I'll regret that I admitted it, because I've already been thinking about it a bit, mm -hmm. which is um, I think that it, there's some virtue in not asking the question that, not asking the question of the political implications, because right now our categories for thinking about politics are very human-centered, and also they put in the foreground certain things that are very important to put into foreground and do a lot of work, like power differentials and um, colonialism, and and um, I mean, it does a lot of good things. But um, what what Radica was saying about w waiting and lying in wait and biding your time, I wonder whether that's a that's a political strategy that might appear to be depoliticized to a lot of people. Um, but I, I think there's something to that, that alongside um, like many-pronged approach to m making things more just or making things better, some of which we would clearly uh, acknowledge to be political and some of which are potentially very transformative but not Recognize, easily recognizable as political. And so I want to keep open a bigger space than there is now for those second set of, of things. And in that second set of things is living a more seedy, um, vegetal life and maybe experimenting with modes of life that, that, are, that follow from that. So that, that's how I would start. Maybe you, you guys want to. 
Or was that just my question? Mm. Yeah. And, and I think partly, Marissa, because you also, um, uh, I think, yeah, both of you also. Uh, like, there may be no uh, really easily, the, the, like the political implica it may be impossible to answer the question, what are the political implications now? It just may be, maybe that's not the right question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you, you also mentioned that there is a, that um, you are trying to, and I, I guess that would be partly the answer, um, in a sense that you are trying to um, uh, think of a, a different language, or, or what is the language of um, vegetal being? Right. right. So what what is that language? If then if I if I may change my question, or um, because I, I I knew that I will I said I will ruin this because I knew that this yeah, question no, of the political is yeah. is probably not the right question. But no, I it's not but a I wrong help. question. It's just maybe mm, it's maybe just one I can, can't answer. No, but I, yeah. I understand <laughs> because you you already said that that you want to think of another language, right? Of or or a, new, a, a different language. I don't want to say newer. So what is that language? Perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, Jane, I think you touched on many moments of sort of invoking that language, but the point is that we can't understand that language, right? I mean, we, we can try our best to, to observe, uh, to, to listen, to watch, but what does that look like to, to have actual interspecies solidarity? Maybe not. it's not a um, linguistic language. Maybe it's a, a movement style or a temp temp temporality mode, a mode of temporality mm -hmm. that would be to, to the, the, the language, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm. But I'm thinking, I mean, I understand, and I'm thinking about uh, also Maria Teresa Alves's work in that this, um, um, this kind of, of speaking, the, this solidarity that, that you mentioned um, is the one that kind of, um, instigates uh, the story, the untold story, right? So in a sense, if you're not 100, or in a, in a sense, there are other stories that can be said, right? If, if you're not 100% human, I mean, that's... <laughs> but part of, I mean, part of it is, is sort of going back to the morning's panel where some, you know, where someone said, it, um, you know, you need to be in a relationship and that takes time, right? And we often think that that interspecies or a, a relational, relational thing is us and someone else, whether they're non-human animals or whether they're plants. It's figuring out how we can speak or figuring out how to give them room, however you construct it. But what it seems to me, and in Katayun in a, in a you know, sort of hugely clear way, if you realize that 50% of you is something, is not what you had thought before, then it seems to me you must shut up for a while and figure out what's going on, right? And, and that, that allows, I mean, it's not an, it's, you know, yes, it can seem like an unpolitics or a depoliticized de space, but it actually is trying to figure out, you know, to, to borrow the idea from earlier, trying to figure out what ground, you know, what the ground is, and as was said earlier, what standing on that ground might actually mean, because you, the, the notions, the, the boundaries that seem, to be, uh, that seem to be clear are precisely the ones that we feel aren't clear anymore. Right? If indeed they were ever clear, but you know, if we were to imagine that you even knew what a human boundary was, that the boundary of one, but once you, once you recognize that that isn't so clear, our, our histories are inter intertwined, our very life is intertwined, what's happening in my stomach right now is, you know, is intertwined. But once you begin to realize that, then, you, then it's not so easy to say, well, there's the mugwort and here is me, and what is, and our relationship is, you know, pulling you up every day. It just isn't that, that interaction doesn't make sense anymore. And I may be slow, but it takes me a while to know. I feel like that requires you to slow down, requires us to slow down. Yeah, and, and I also think that you, want, you would want to have multiple 
types of discourses simultaneously operative, because if some if there's a group of people who are being tortured or right, right of course, then you invoke another language that is the the other one, mm. the more perhaps anthropocentric one, and then you have that simultaneously being infused and enriched back and forth with this other way of thinking, and it's just that that other way of living and thinking doesn't have well established institutional spaces, mm. or as well established institutional spaces as that other way. And and I think what the what we're t all talking about here is, um, um, what are we talking about? <laughs> we're talking about, um, we're trying to give more presence to that second set of things, just more presence. Uh, because it may be the case that that, that the language of, um, of that that was invoked more in the first panel, I mean, it's clearly very useful, and it's clearly very it, it can it has some potency to it. And I wouldn't want to say that that should be displaced or it's wrong. It, it's just multiple multiple discourses uh, commingling, and and we don't know what this one is going to do. We have a better sense of what that one is going to do, and the fact that that one isn't as effective as we would like it to have been mm -hmm. means that we want to multiply these other these other forces and flows that. I mean, if this one was working perfectly, I don't think we would have as much incentive to explore this possible pipe dream over here. Yeah. Or, or more or imaginative one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's important that it, you know, it, it's about the imaginary and it's about what, what we don't know, right? So what can we create by, you know, taking a piece of, of plant and literally eating it? You know, like, are you gonna get high now? <laughs> no, I mean, I don't. What does that even mean, right? Like, so, so how do we cross cross the space of of language that doesn't look like what we know of as lang as our, you know, even if it is what we're able to do as as these in these bodies, right? In the as these beings, which are separate, but not really, not anymore, you know. So. But I, I mean, Jane, I have to say, I am intrigued at the idea of a, of trying to find a, 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 langu a linguistic language. I, I'm I'm intrigued by that challenge. Um, well, you did a great job in both of you in in I mean, a poetics of it. It has to be, yeah. Mm. I mean, uh, w if you can, like, you use those eight things and. That what you those eight things were a mixture of the metaphorical and the um, li literal, and and I that's another place where I like to go when thinking about how to write and talk in regular in human language about that is to push metaphors to the point of literality, mm -hmm. and because metaphors you know like you're, you're inspired by something that's because you've breathed it in inspiration right so that's just an obvious example. Um, so yeah, you could, if we were very literary, we could come up, we could embark on a project of naming what maybe many of us in the room have sort of intuitively done when we're trying to speak about such issues mm. about plants and vegetal self and this and that. Mm. We've, we've turned to these tropes and tricks and, and styles of speaking. And if we could, I'm a, a little bit trying to embark on formalizing what a list of the, and you, you did too, what a list of those things might mm. look like. And that, that's why I moved to that thing, the middle voice, yeah. Mm. Um, perhaps I open the floor for some questions. If, uh, are there any questions? Hi. Thank you. Um, so I am th also thinking of this uh, panel in relation to the first panel, um, communication across which to some may come to seem an irreducible difference, or from which may emerge some hint of incommensurability. Um, <laughs> So, I, sorry, I'm, I'm reading this just to keep myself on track. I, I tried to write something down. So, although there may be some perceived or even felt relation bet between some indigenous worldviews and the promotion of the vitality of all things, it seems uh, to me that the focus on the vitality of the non-human in some ways requires the feeling that colonialism is a settled issue, or in other words, it needs a kind of uh, subliminal acceptance of settler colonialism that attempts to escape anthropocent anthropocentrism and a subject-object object binary, moving toward an emphasis on a vegetal and distributive agency, 
or even subjectivity, that the vegetal or even inanimate vitality can start to become a perfect subject, uh, less unruly than those indigenous colonized or native humans who they come to replace. So um, maybe you could address that possible tension um, that has begun to emerge, uh, perhaps around an apprehension that a danger may lie and attempts to move away from anthropocentrism. A danger may lie in playing into the erasure of colonized subjects or actual, if I could say that, indigenous or native humans. I really don't think people are standing in line or that oppression is standing in a line. I mean, I, I guess that's, that would be one place. Like, I don't think that there is the, the, the complication, certainly the complication that Maria Teresa's project brings to us mm -hmm. is that all of these are, are encapsulated all together. In the seed, in the seed as, as what it was, is the history of that oppression and is the history of incredible violence and savagery. So I don't, you know, I, to, to my mind, look, because you start from the seed in a line on a page doesn't mean the other one is set aside. Um, if, if anything, I, um, uh, I can speak for my, only for myself, but anything, a, a project such as being interested in, in the vegetal or in the, in the non-human is actually a project of trying to expand the terrain of participation so that you know, sort of, you, you kind of begin to get a sense of who who or what is in the room. And every erasure, you know, just tells you how many others, you know, are behind there. And, and the difficulty, I mean, that's one of the difficulties I find when relation, you know, not that relationality is intended that way, but sometimes you think it's like you and someone else, and it's, the, it's like two things coming into being. The conversation this morning was already opening up that the politics of Occupy, for example, you know, already occlude other sets of, so you know that even in that, in that very human story, there are multiple stories, multiple humans, not in the picture. So to me, the, a, a, a project of either vegetal excavation or a project of, of non-human non animal one is actually expanding the terrain and, expand, and, and allowing the possibility for some very, very unexpected alliances, um, rather than saying, we, we must wait our turn in the way in which, you know, when you were in civil rights, you, you, know, you said race, race is really important, women, wait your turn. So it's not a matter of people don't have to wait, everyone can be there together, and, and that's the expansion that I, I would hope um, is part of, a, a, you know, a part of the politics of a project that takes something like this seriously. Um, I think I'll try to respond to maybe what's inside the concern, um, and I think, and I would, well, I think, what's inside the concern is that is is the truth that distributed agency means distributed moral culpability, and and I think that that is one of the implica one of the necessary implications of thinking of oneself as thinking of uh, uh, as thinking of agency as distributed between different bodies, some human, some not, some vegetable, some animal, etc., and and what that does is make it difficult to think about culpability in the same way that we have, which is not to say that we couldn't start to imagine other systems of responsibility, perhaps even with a punishment component or a reparations component, but it's not going to be the same one because distributed agency is also distrib it, 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 it weakens out or disseminates moral culpability. And I think it, those two, th I think you're right to point that out as a as a, something to worry about and something to a project to to engage in now, um, if if the individual moral morally responsible agent, the human individually morally responsible agent, is is um, if we're questioning that, we can't question that without also thinking about what um, what valuable functions that fiction served. Um, and we have to find another way of addressing or compensating for, or, or you know, a, a structural parallel for that that system of moral culpability. But I don't. But my own view is, I mean, I don't want to get rid of it just yet because you know we don't have anything else for holding people responsible or addressing harms and wrongs from the past. I would just also say that these these plants are all around us, and if we 
uncover those stories by spending time and, and giving space to those other entities, we can learn from them. So to think about other frequencies, to think about plant spirit medicine, to think about what it means to sit with a plant and, mm. and just do that and just see what, what comes of that. And maybe you don't know what that is. And, right. and that's kind of, you know, I, I think what we're all sort of touching on is that the, there's not a knowing and, and a, an erasure of the past. It's, it's the coming through of the stories by being a vehicle, right? But by being open uh, to something else. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have to ask, since you're all here, about um, storytelling and plants that has inspired you. So examples of, of work, of, of books, of movies, of whatever um, that you think is well done and that you would recommend for us? Oh, heavens. Never good at that. Well, you were speaking about Whitman. <laughs> <laughs> no? Happenings. The happenings. Okay. I mean, are you talking specifically about any one kind of? Um, no, I'm talking about <laughs> seeds and storytelling, quite literally, the title of this panel. Just stuff that's inspired you since you're all here. Well, I think that I think that the the title comes from um, Maria Teresa Alves' work, right? And and the the stories, the st oh no, on her work, right? Yeah, um, the stories that come um, by uh, thinking with the plants and the seeds that um, that she en encounters, um, uh, stories that have been untold in kind of. Uh, Canonical histories, um, and and how, how and so this is why we're talking about what what it allows or what kind of stories right does it allow does it allow a, a kind of different language or or story. Um, I think it's a fair right question. Now. I'm just my mind has gone blank. I mean, I you know I think it's a it's a reasonable it's a reasonable and good question. Um, I mean, I think of Richard Maybe's book on weeds, but it's, you know, that's not necessarily an example of, of, of storytelling. It's just a, a really good example, though, of, um, of the sort of parallel lives of humans and, and plants, you know, and, and how closely related, in a sense, our, you know, our environments are. So weeds and, weeds and humans go together, mm. you know, it's kind of twinned. But, th you know, that's not necessarily an example of good, good storytelling, but it's certainly an example of illuminating something about that relationship. I mean, I am a fan of Michael Pollan's Botany of Desire. Mm. And also, uh, I cited in my paper, Tao Orion wrote a book called Beyond the War on Invasive Species, which is kind of about this interplay of why conservationists just are looking to eradicate these plants instead of looking at them, looking at their ecosystem functions to see how they can, since they're here, since we're, we're at this point where we can't separate, we can go back, right, to, to kind of go back to that earlier panel. Um, but but here we are. So what now? And so how how do we move forward with all of these things? In obviously, you know, thinking about all of them together, holding them in the same basket. And then I think of you know Walcott's Omaros, which is not exactly about seeds and plants, but t definitely has a, a very rich account of of words and vocabularies that tie in, you know, the kind of the, the wood that made the ships, the things that are in the soil. And so you begin to realize what oh. it means for, for language to destabilize something along with, you know, like what, it, what in the environment do you need to know to, in order to feel at home, right? And what does it mean to encounter and not feel at home? Yeah, actually, I thought of one more. Um, Whitman's poem, Song of the Broad Axe, is really good because it's about the, it's about the, the wood of the axe and the metal that goes into the wood of the axe that led to all of the the, ob the, the object, the axe, and the, all the things that the ox, axe can produce in its wake. Yeah, actually, um, Marissa's, uh, uh, Marissa, what you said about the uh, invasive species reminded me of something that I wanted to ask you. And again, it's, um, 
Going back to, I mean, I understand that this language uh, around invasive uh, species is quite, um, um, you know, the eradic the, to, to say that we want to eradicate weeds or um, an invasive species is quite violent, right, um, as a language. Um, but, but then sometimes we forget that invasive species arrive um, because of the practices of um, the free market, mm -hmm. right, for example. So, for example, I was just in Spain and uh, there's this uh, Asian um, wasp that has come uh, to Spain with, uh, with ships and ships bringing mm. um, um, products, right? It's, it's this logic of the free market that that, and this is what I think with, with Maria Teresa Alves also. It's uh, ships are bringing uh, slaves as products, uh, things, products. And then the byproduct of that is that you have Asian wasps in Spain eating bees. They, um, they eat bees. And the problem is that um, bees in Asia know Right? It's an embodied, of mm. course, experience. Know how to uh, get rid of these wasps because <laughs> because they um, they um, together, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they exert heat that kills the, the wasp. And I mean, I wish we could invite those bees to Spain to give a workshop, you know, for example, <laughs> to, to the local bees. Uh, uh, but we can't, right? Um, and um, and I was just thinking about um, about how sometimes these invasive species come, right? So we think of them perhaps akin to immigrants. And, and this is where I, I would say that I'm with you. I mean, and I, I think the further we go from metaphor and symbol, the better. But the problem is that with invasive species, for example, we all speak of them, including myself, as immigrants. But what if we think of them, and I don't want to, get into the binary as settler, for example, right? That changes the whole equation. Yeah, that would. I mean, that, that would change. That would. Uh, that would implicate many more people. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so um, I don't know if, if Marissa, you, I mean, so again, thinking of how, how these arrive, I mean, not, uh, I mean, putting settler uh, indigenous uh, on the side, but with this, with this free market policy, right? Um, I mean, against the free movement of people, but with the f free movement of products, then you have a byproduct, right? And invasive species become, become um, part of this. Um, I mean, I don't know how, you know, how you would think of uh, deal with invasive species. I'm not at all uh, proposing to eradicate again, but what kind of, uh, uh, in in what different ways? So how how um, how do they not become symbolic and metaphorical in a sense? And how does their how is there a kind of um, um, yeah? I mean, how how do you also produce different meanings from thinking from uh, no the point of view of the the plant in a sense? I would say that um, kind of akin to slaves that were brought here and to many other places on ships without, without wanting that, right? These plants have traveled as a result of us, of humans, taking them and, you know, lifting soil from one place and moving it to another. So I, I can't say that those plants can, can even be implicated in that. You know, they, they obviously are causing havoc in, in Spain and, and the bees are, are dying and the bees are dying in America because we're you know, pesticides. pesticides are killing them and killing us. So, so how can we ever really implicate some other being without first implicating those those other people who are who are doing that? So I think um, those are those are really difficult things to separate for me. Um, and you know, also thinking earlier in the earlier panels about this this notion of of settler colonialism and and these plants sort of metaphorically standing in for that and and being present in our landscapes as to remind us of this of this destroyed past that is violent and all of these other things but but what if and and I know this is a radical notion what if we we could see that as liberation for them for those plants um, freeing them from those stories trying at at best we can to 
to unpack those complications of humans interfering, right? So they, they didn't come without us. And they, we, we try to contend with them as best we can, right? The EPA regulates certain plants as invasive based on so many different things that happen, you know, co the, the plants colonizing different landscapes based on soil, based on uh, eradicating other native species and doing that native species. So, um, but those species are native because humans brought them there always, right? So, so the origin of, it, of everything, right? Like, how do we know where the first seed came from? What is, does that even, that's where I kind of sit but transportation, you know, New York's biggest migrant is the brown rat, right? No, so-called Norwegian rat who is not Norwegian, but actually came, comes from sort of Mongolia and Asia and so on. And um, the, for a time in New York, there was a rat czar who, you know, whose responsibility was try to eradicate the, ra the rats uh, in the Giuliani administration. The rat czar, you know, mainly in the subways, the rat czar is now the head of our MTA. So there's a transportation theme, right? <laughs> who's, who's supposedly the person, Joe Lota, who, you know, who is supposedly responsible for our things running on time. Now the same, same summer, that is this summer, when New York City declared itself a sanctuary city in response to the sort of public um, is also the summer where, there, where New York City uh, sort of parks and wildlife has been doing a fairly big campaign on wildlife as New Yorkers. So raccoons, and you'll see them on the, on the subway or on, on, uh, car, on taxis and so on. So the picture of a raccoon or a picture of a coyote, and it says New Yorker. But simultaneously now on the, on the garbage bins, there is a whole campaign on how to eradicate the rat. I'm just giving you these, not because I'm, I'm a scattershot person, but I don't think these, this assemblage of relationships is accidental, right? It's like all of these things are hap our notions of sanctuary, our notions of, my, of our sort of anti-immigrant notions, our selectivity about who is in and what is out. Is, is, you know, is part of the same thing. And yes, indeed, the person who should run a transportation system was responsible for moving things is also the guy who knows a thing or two about rats, right? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I would just like to, uh, to say a few things about this invasive species or not. Uh, there is a uh, difference between introduced species and invasive species, right? And in, in, in invasive species, either plants or insects or other animals, are by definition the species that are destructive of environment, of uh, ecological system. They are, in a way, they are genocidal plants or, in, or um, species. If they are left alone, they destroy up other species, species, it's either or. Now if we look, and this is technical definition, we can look at this as uh, moral agents and ask, you know, what do we do with that? Because, you know, the, the and you know, if you look at any any species, any ecosystem, if we can go back, you know, if we can, if we if we, if we knew the origins, we would say the native species were introduced and so on. But you know, that's an inconsequential di discussion because all the nature is m affected or is made or made uh, uh, given meaning by by humans. So we we we, we don't get get. Anywhere, there. but we can look historically or politically at these uh, issues, and we we'll see those invasive species are part of an invasive uh, of an invasive historical process of the colonization. They are an integral part of it. In they are by product of the continuing existence of this system. So, is the question? It's not the question of uh, equating. I mean, I know that people do that. Invasive species with an immigrant, and uh, we should e exterminate them all. But you know, now to get to, to, pro to prescribe the language of, inv of 
invasive species would lead us to a spot when we become Holocaust deniers. And you know, if we, if we go away from the species and talk about other things we don't like, we would not say, oh, it's good to have a little bit of homophobia, or a little bit of sexual harassment. They just came here, they are they like this, but we are not going there. I mean, we could look at these invasive species as harassing. I mean, we could uh, use a number of political or the more the, uh, 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 ethical or moral languages to describe them, but we can uh, we can uh, we can avoid the moral di moral dim dimension. We can argue against po political uh, abuse of those terms. But I, I don't think we should give our political re responsibility for dealing with a situation which we have produced. Um, there, was, there was a question here. Thank you. Um, would you like to respond? Mm. Marissa? I, I think no? not. Mm. I wasn't sure. Thank, thank you, everyone. Um, it, this has been very, very insightful. I'm going to make my own disclaimer. and. My disclaimer is that I'm a Puerto Rican going through collective trauma. Mm -hmm. um, my island has been erased and eradicated. I happen to be in a network of people that are at the forefront of the resiliency movement. And I'm also in touch with people that are working on the plan of reforestation. And as a person that about two weeks ago delivered a suitcase of 50 pounds of seeds, not knowing what I was doing, um, I'm going through a lot, <laughs> and I am hearing a lot of the things that are going on in here. I apologize for crying, <laughs> but there's this is all interconnected. This is so incredibly interconnected. We mentioned solidarity. We mentioned erasure, September 20th. And we mentioned multiple discourses happening at once. And I think these all need to happen aggressively at once. Climate change is revealing colonialism and the lack of interconnectivity and ability of the islands to respond with dignity. Um, and so I think kind of shutting that blind eye on politics is actually something that we need to step up to the plate and say we can't shut that. Um, that, that it is interconnected um, because it's, uh, although I don't know what I'm doing by sending 50 pounds of seeds on behalf of people that are, are aggressively working with farmers on the ground, I know that that help will get to my island before any other help. Um, that it will probably be faster to grow cucumber <laughs> than, <laughs> than to expect a crappily packaged sausage. <laughs> which we know what that means also, right? You know, food sovereignty and, and resiliency, all these things. And so I, I, I don't mean to like, kind of like make this a therapy session, but I mean <laughs> to make, like to kind of bring light um, to this issue and also humbly to also ask, ask for help um, because I don't know what I'm doing, but I know that I'm in the right circles and I'm in the right networks and I'm in around people that are very credible and respectful and progressive and I know I can also share um, my two cents on, on how that is shaping an entire population that is being forced to leave at a rate never, never seen before. Um, and that is literally because of lack of seeds, and lack of food, and lack of resources. So in, in the conversations that I've been having with people is, you know, how do we center our environment to give us the autonomy and self-sufficiency to come out of this <laughs> natural yet non-natural disaster that has been shaped by not just one, but two waves of colonization. Um, so all that to kind of like just respond, listen, and to, you know, respond to even, you know, what you had said, like who is in the room because there are a lot of incredible people here, and there are also places where this energy could could be very beneficial and could be very helpful. 
So thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was a question here. Just a moment. Um, yeah, and also just in solidarity to what you just said, I, my, the island where my family is from was uh, saw the eye of the storm of Typhoon Haiyan and sending seeds it sounds like a much better plan and sending seeds now than waiting for the package of fake rice or GMO corn to um, be supplied for them. Um, so that's great that you're on that um, Im impulse. So um, my, my question is about this um, desire for a language of plants and, uh, and seeds and I, I kind of want to just articulate the question now so it doesn't get lost in sort of the side details, but sort of I'm curious about like the discrepancy between our sort of conscious positionality in relation to plants and our abstracted relationship to them um, from colonialism. Uh, you know, like language in order to main have a, maintain a language requires regular exposure, regular practice, just being with the plant, but that could also include you know, ingesting the plant or eating the plant or smoking the plant or with the tura, if you take the leaves and you put it on your, your arm, a sore, sore muscle, it, it relieves the pain because um, uh, of the, 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 the toxin. Um, so there's d many different ways to maintain a relationship and a language uh, a, to keep in touch with the plant. Um, the, some plants don't like to be touched, like nettle, though you can ingest it. Um, I'm, I'm curious, though, about this discrepancy of, of, our, of our intimacy with plants and our desire to have a relationship with them. For example, seeds, like coffee. How many people in this room have a daily relationship to coffee? Um, multiple times of, of in intercourse with coffee. But how, how many times have you actually uh, peeled a, a b coffee bean from 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 its uh, outside and or taking it from its tree, so we were having maintaining these very intimate relationships with seeds and plants, po you know, possibly intimate relationships. But we d are so far from uh, relating to it. I mean, if people are talking about coffee beans, they're talking about you know the, geo the geographical source uh, that it's uh, it's fair trade from Indonesia, where it's not from, or from um, Me Mexico, where it's not from. So or from, um, you know, so th we, we maintain that kind of uh, logic of r relationality, but the, the daily intimacies and the daily relations, which is what language is, um, I'm, I'm just wondering how that, um, how, how do we, how do we make sense of the discrepancies? Because obviously, the, co the story of coffee is one of colonial extraction and um, industrial expansion, um, which we are, are part of that narrative. So yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking, how can we, how do we maintain these languages of, like, come closer to um, understanding that desire for having a language of plants um, beyond this abstracted relationship to them? I'll just make one, thank you for all those comments. Um, I think it's probably more potent to have a hands-on embodied relationship to those things, but I wouldn't rule out some kind of residual power of abstractly thinking about them either. <laughs> I think that's really important, but I, I also, I do believe in the power of touching plants as being part of that, that knowing, being part of that, um, having that relationship or as, as you said so beautifully, s literally sending seeds to somebody to say, grow this. Maybe you've never done it. Maybe it's something that will teach you more than you know. Just to, you know, even doing this work with the new school, we've, we've worked with, with students, some of which are, are here in this room, to grow plants. They grew them in their dorm room. Some of them had never grown a plant like this before from seed, right? So, so what, is, what relationship do you build with that plant? That, that's not, you, you can't guess until, until you take that action. So I think that is a political action. And I do think that, um, that in places seeds are, it's illegal to save your seeds. Um, and it's, 
it's illegal to to give those away. So that is also a radical act and a political action in in many cultures, but also here in in America. So part of part of this exhibition, and, and I'll be leading some seed walks where we'll go around and we'll collect these wild seeds. And if if you're you have a hankering for for doing that work, please come join us because it's uh, it can it can open you in different ways that that I think you you don't you can't know until you try that. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the earlier comment about invasive uh, uh, plants. Um, and if I understood you correctly, I, I think what you're saying is that um, it doesn't matter so much whether it's native, but what matters is its style of hogging the scene and um, domination and bullying other plants, to use human vocabulary for that. And um, I, I think that's an important point. I think that some, some plants in some settings will dominate and people will, might want to intervene in, on the side of the weaker powers, the other plants. And I just wanted to say also that uh, you point importantly to strife, that that vegetal vegetal self and that the, the different genomes that are in the human doesn't mean that they're all smoothly functioning with one another. So I would like to just add in the, the strife element, even, even with this broadened sense of humanity, even with this greater attentiveness to seeds and what they can change, but there's strife too. There's, uh, yes, there's a question, and then we, yeah. I, I will have just a quick um, comment that actually builds off what I think I understood from your point, but I wanted to first just thank uh, you all for this, such a rich, incredible session. I learned a lot from it, and it's really provocative and stimulating. I was just gonna say something that may be obvious, but I didn't kind of hear it coming through in the explicitness, and the way that I heard you talking about the abstraction I think of that as about a colonial uh, relationship and what does it mean to try and overcome that. Um, we have this colonial overlay that has divorced so many people from uh, a relationality to plants that has always been a part of indigenous epistems. And so that idea of how people are renegotiating a relationship that they maybe never had or they have no uh, continuous intergenerational memory of I think is really different than those who come from cultures where it's really, we're talking two generations ago, uh, and it's still, there's such a continuity in the cultural traditions that it's not hard to reconnect or there, it hasn't been lost at all. Um, in the case, I'll, I'll, I mentioned taro cultivation and taro restoration in Hawaii earlier. The taro, the, the transliteration in Hawaiian, it, it comes from kalo, uh, the K for the T, the R for the L. And uh, Kalo in Hawaiian um, genealogy is the elder sibling to the human Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. And so it's an elder sibling and there's an actual genealogical tie to Haloa. Haloa is, Haloa is the name of the Kalo. And it's not metaphorical. We're actually, it's about tracing an actual genealogical tie. So it's actual kin. It's not, again, metaphorical. And part of that has a longer history around the the root of the kalo comes, at least the lesson that I've been taught in my genealogy, is that that comes from a miscarriage from a pregnancy that shouldn't have happened between Ho'ohoku Kalani, the, star do the daughter of the stars, and her father, Wakea, who impregnated her. And she miscarried and planted the uh, miscarried substance, and out comes the staple food of the Hawaiian people. It is a complete, it's one of the most complex carbohydrates that I, that I understand on planet Earth. And it's also got the green stock. And so it, it and it's wetland taro. So I mean, I know there's lots of taro all over the globe, but you know, you can pretty much survive on that coconut and an occasional piece of fish, you know, for a few thousand years. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that because even today, people in, in family will just say, I'm gonna go eat haloa. They don't even say I'm going to go eat kalo. <laughs> they, they, they name the food by the, our elder sibling. So just wanted to acknowledge that, that for a lot of people that's sort of, it's so, um, it's so close and it's such a vital part of our actual, um, I don't know, not just worldviews, but ways of living, ways of knowing. Thank you. Uh, 
Ah, uh, time. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> so, so time is up. I'm sorry. We'll have to end uh, in the session. And I think just um, just to end um, and I uh, just to echo with the, with the last um, comment and with Radika as well. I think because I think seeds and and plants are very much archives uh, that um, um, that are sometimes um, or at times. Y you need to um, poke, poke them to, in order to also to activate um, the telling of a story, but that they hold within them, um, uh, yeah, like an archive. No, you kind of unpacked these different archives that a seed um, uh, holds, um, and so yeah, many of them are these genealogies, um, which have to do with the history of colonialism. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, really. Thank you for the for this great panel for everyone. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming, and thank you, Lara, and to our speakers today. Um, my name is Amanda Parmer. I'm the curator for the Vera List Center, and I just wanted to say what a pleasure it's been to be able to see all of these conversations come together for the beginning of the celebration of our 2016-2018 Vera List Center Prize for Art and Politics. It's a conference that we've been very excited to put together. The second day will be tomorrow, Saturday, beginning at noon. But right now, we would really like to urge you to join us at 66 West 12th Street um, for a meet and greet with all of the panelists, where you'll be able to share a drink and conversation with them. And then at 6 o'clock, we're going to have the keynote conversation with Maria Teresa Alves, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, and Karen Cooney. Um, and then we're also going to have the prize presentation, um, which will be introduced by our Dean Mary Watson. And then at 6.45, we'll have the opening of the exhibition at 66 Fifth Avenue. Um, and so we hope that you will join us for all of those events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.